In this video, I'm going to expand on an HTML page that we made earlier with a few HTML tags that everyone should know. Now, one note, this is HTML4. Uh, currently, there's an HTML5 version out, so I'm not going to cover any of those new tags. But nonetheless, these tags are things that everyone should know regardless of HTML version. A few sources. First of all, website echoecho.com. That's one I've used since I first started teaching at UC back in the 2000-2001 school year. Uh, it really covers these fundamentals quite well. Uh, secondly, my own University of Cincinnati website, which is homepages.uc.edu slash tilde jonesbr. And this is from a Fundamentals of the Web course that I taught a few years ago. So I have several slides that talk about CSS and HTML, CSS, web design, and the like. So I've put those together into this presentation, a few of the selected examples into this presentation. And finally, control U. Remember that when we're looking at a website, in many browsers, we can either right click and save U source or hold control and press U, and that will show us the source of a page. So view source, there we go. And we can take a look at this uh, HTML that we see in this page here, just like so. Let me zoom up a little bit. You can look at a lot of these tags and the like. So those are some references. Now one note, there are many good tools available that will build an HTML page for you automatically and do quite a good job of it also. There's Microsoft's Expression Web. There are several tools from Adobe. There are some online generators and many other ways we can do it. In this case though, we want to build a, an HTML page by hand because what we want to do is we want to practice learning XML by building a page that is valid HTML and valid XML. We can demonstrate a lot of these concepts together. So I'm going to start with the uh, project that we worked on in a previous video, add to this page. And I'll, I'll toggle back and forth between the presentation and that page. So first of all, text. A few things we've already seen, H1, and, uh, so H1 through H6, these are different relative font sizes with H1 being the largest and H6 being the smallest. So let me go ahead and open this up in Chrome. We'll open the page as it is now, and we can see a difference between the H2 and the uh, H3. Also pay attention to the EM. EM means emphasis, which very often means uh, italics, but we can use cascading style sheets, which we'll talk about in a future video, to make that not italics. We can use EM, we can style it up however we wish. We'll give it just a few moments here to start up and visualize the page. But uh, while it's doing that, I'll go back and take a look at a few other things. So H1, the biggest text we can have, all the way down to H6 is the smallest. A good way to organize our page conceptually from a kind of a superheading down to a subheading. EM, emphasis, mention that one. And then strong. Strong is traditionally represented by bold. But again, we can override that and give that a different definition if we wish. Okay, I uh, give it just a moment here to reload. And sure enough, now we can see our page in the browser. Welcome to my page is our H2. You see this one's a little bit smaller. It's our H3. And then you see our emphasis tag here in the near future. And if I wish, I can go ahead and make this one strong, uh, just like so, to indicate that this should be bold or whatever kind of styling I wish to apply. Uh, oops, sorry, Control-Z, Control-Z. Little undo magic here as I get this guy fixed and strong. There we go. Okay. Okay. We know white space doesn't matter, but I'm just going to make that a little bit a little bit neater. So save. And let's see if that refreshes. Sure enough, that refreshes automatically on our page. Okay, so a few ones that we can use uh, to take a look at text. Next, let's think about a list. With a list, we need a combination of tags. First, we need to choose. Do we want an ordered list or something that is numbered? Do we want an unordered list or something that is not numbered, which is going to be a set of bullet points? So let's make that choice first. OL for an ordered list, UL for an unordered list. Now, inside of the OL or the UL, we need a set of LI tags to represent each list item. So let's go back to our page, and I'm going to say my favorite trees for Greater Cincinnati, uh, because a tree that is native in Greater Cincinnati might not be native elsewhere. Now I'm going to say OL, so ordered list. Notice it closes for me. Then within that, I'm going to say LI, and I'll say Paul Paul, wonderful tree. Then we'll say LI, and we'll say Redbud, 
And then we'll do another li, and we'll say Fuji Apple. Uh, that's a trademark, so I will note that's a trademark, but we'll go ahead and save. And let's go back, take a look at our page again, and you see my favorite trees for Greater Cincinnati. Notice it's a numbered list, okay? Uh, if I want it to be just a bulleted list, we change the UL, and it was kind enough to synchronize these for me. We change the OL to a UL, or unordered list. Come back and notice that these appear now as bullet points. So not too bad, a few tags that we can use to make a list. Okay, hyperlink. So hyperlink is how we go from one page to another. So hyperlink can be uh, relative, in other words, it can be a page that is local to our site, or absolute if we want to refer to a different website, or simply a location within a page. If we have a very long page, we want to break it into sections, we can do that and then create hyperlinks that go from one section to another. As a general rule, any page that's local to the site we're on should be relative. Any page that's on a different site should be absolute. That allows us to uh, make our website kind of fluid. It lets us switch our domain name and things like that if we're using relative URLs within our own website. So uh, first of all, I'll, do, I'll demonstrate both of these. I'm going to choose Add, and we will say HTML page, and we'll call this Contact Us or About Us or something like that. Contact us.html. Go ahead and save that. OK, uh, send me an email. I'm just going to do a quick and dirty here. Save like so. OK, so index HTML and contact us HTML, these two are sitting right next to each other. So I can make a relative hyperlink to get from index to contact, uh, contact us. I'll use the A tag, and then I'll say href. OK, notice that Visual Studio was helping me along the way. I could use a text editor for this, or I could use Visual Studio. One nice thing is take a look. Visual Studio has an idea that we probably want to connect to this Contact Us page. So it gives us that option as a dropdown. And I'll say Contact Us. OK, now I can nest the A tag within a list item as well. So for Paul Paul, or for, let's take Redbud. For Redbud, I could link to plantplaces.com and I could search here for Redbud. Okay, Eastern Redbud, excellent tree for this area. Um, it is native, has edible flowers, and has very low fertilization requirements. So I'm going to take this hyperlink that we have, or this website address we have at the top of my browser, and I'm going to turn that into a hyperlink. A href equals, double quote, double quote, so surround it with double quotes, paste in that full link, then uh, go ahead and close my A tag, and notice it adds a closing tag for me as well. So we have to be a little bit careful here. What I want to do is I want to have a href and then the full hyperlink. Then I want to close that open tag for the A tag. Then is the hyperlink text the user will see, and after that, we close, uh, we close our A tag with a closing tag right here. Sorry, that's a bit hard to describe. It's a little easier to see on line 19. So let's look at that. This is our open tag for our A tag. Remember that an A tag is a hyperlink. This is the hyperlink text that the user will see. Okay, and then we have to close our A tag here to say end the hyperlink here. If we didn't have that close A tag, it would hyperlink the entire rest of the page, which would not look very pretty. So let me go ahead and save, and we'll go back and we'll refresh our page one more time. Notice the Contact Us. Watch the URL up at the top of my browser. As I click on Contact Us, you see it goes to Contact Us and send me an email. I'll go back and now notice that Paul Paul is hyperlinked, and if I click on Paul Paul, look what comes up. Here is that detail page that describes Oh, geez, okay, it's a red butt, isn't it? So I put it on the wrong one. No problem, that's an easy fix, but here's the detail page that shows photos of a red bud tree. So yeah, let's go ahead and fix that before I forget. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll simply switch the word red bud and the word paw paw. So paw paw, there we go. And red bud, we'll change it up here. Okay, and save. Okay, so now we've seen a couple of hyperlinks. We've seen a bit of navigation. Okay, what else do we have? So hyperlinks, uh, after that we have an image. Now for an image we have several options. First of all, image source equals. 
That acts just like the hyperlink we just saw. We can have that link to a local file, or we can have that lo link to a file that's uh, on a website with an absolute path. A good idea to use our own image here so we're not stealing somebody else's intellectual property. So at the bare minimum, we need this IMG tag, and notice this is a self-closing tag as you see here. So at the bare minimum, we need this IMG tag. We need an attribute called source. We need to set that equal to an image file. And we also really, really should have alt. And then we should have text that describes the image. Uh, we want to think about this for users who have different abilities, maybe users who are visually impaired. Uh, we want to give them a, a description of what the image is in case this is a user who can't physically see the image. Now with height and border, this all has to do with styling. Those are optional. And as a matter of fact, I would almost recommend that we don't use those because we can accomplish a lot of these same attributes using cascading style sheets which we haven't talked about yet, but not to worry, that's coming shortly. Let's go ahead and, and make an image. I'll grab uh, one of my Redbud images here. I'll try to grab one that I actually took. Uh, so again, I'm not stealing someone else's image. Let's see. I know I've taken a fair, here, I'll tell you what, we'll just look for Brandon here. Here we go, the uh, Kentucky Artisan Center. Oh, look at this guy. Uh, so yeah, this one will work. So I'm going to say copy image, and let's go back to our web page. It's a good idea to put images in a separate folder. So I'll say, I'll right click on my web service project in Visual Studio, and then I'm going to choose add, and then I'm going to choose new folder, and we'll call this image. Okay, so, or we could call it, you know what, uh, probably images to indicate that there are multiple images here. Okay, right click, and uh, it's not gonna let me paste. So I might just need to say, okay, where do I wanna put this? Just a moment. So right click, click, copy image. Okay, I was curious if it would let me paste. It doesn't look like it wants to do that, but that's okay. Open folder in File Explorer, that's just as well. This takes us to the absolute path of this folder on my file system. So here I can right click and say new, and I can say bitmap image. Uh, now you know what, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I will do it in paint. So I'll just simply open up paint, okay? and I'll paste in that image, we'll crop to make it look good. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to be a little bit tricky here, but I'm going to copy this full path from Windows Explorer, then choose File, Save As, and I'm going to paste the full path up here, up here in the browser, okay? And then we're going to call this one redbud.png. Okay, and save. It's a little roundabout way of doing it, but nonetheless, we did get the image Redbud inside of our images folder. And if I go back to Visual Studio now, I can show you a little trick, and that is you don't see this image under the images folder, right? So it gets a little frustrating. You know it's there, but it's not in the project. So we click on Show All Files, and now you see some things that have been hidden. And there's Redbud kind of with a little outline there, and I saw a little preview there too, which is really handy. Let's go ahead, right click, and say include in project. There we go. Okay, so now that's part of our project, and now we can reference that in our index.html. I'll go ahead and unchoose uh, show all files. So index.html, okay. Now I'm going to add an image, and remember our tag, img src. Uh, since this is an image that is in our local project, we might as well use a relative path. Remember, relative path is great, in case we decide to change our domain name, or in other words, our .com name. Now it helps us out here because it showed us, shows us the folder images. I can click on that and take a look. It shows us redbud.png, not bad. Now remember, we always wanna do alt text as well uh, so that we can make sure our, our web page is suitable for all users. So for alt, I'm going to say a redbud tree with beautiful pink, blossoms. Okay, and this is a self-closing tag, so we do the slash on the question mark key in an American keyboard and um, and then the, the greater than symbol. Okay, uh, so there we go, and save. Now with that, let's go back to our browser, refresh the page, and sure enough, there is the red bud. Okay, now you know that we did have some options to resize the image 
Uh, so if we go back here, we can give it a width and a height if that size doesn't work for us. But a word of advice here, it's a good idea to resize the image itself instead of applying constraints to the image in HTML. In other words, I could say width equals 80. Okay, height equals 80. Now this is perfectly valid HTML, don't get me wrong, but we do have a few considerations here. First of all, the image doesn't look good when it's resized using HTML. Better to resize it with a real image resizer than tell HTML to make it look a certain way. Number two, it doesn't save us anything on downloading because you see it still is downloading that full size image. So the last thing you want to do is take a huge resolution image push it down to a browser and then resize it once it reaches the browser. That's unnecessarily consuming more bandwidth than required. So that's an image tag. Okay, a few more we're going to look at. Div and span. These are really important uh, for breaking our page into sections. Uh, so div allows us to take an entire unit and say uh, make one section out of it. So you see open div and close div. And I will go ahead and move the close div all the way to the bottom here. Typically, we'll give the div something like a class. We'll say class equals content. Now, what's interesting about div is I'll save this, I'll refresh the page, and we'll see no difference. And that is on purpose. A div is not visible unless we choose to apply some kind of special styling to it. Now, a span is just like a div, but a span is inline where a div it's an entire block of text. Okay, why do we want to use div then? Let me show you a rather advanced example from the Plant Places website. Take a look at this. I'm going to go back to our search results page where we can see our red button. Okay, let me just type in the word red like so. And we're going to see a whole bunch of different plants here. Now, this is not very print friendly, is it? Okay, no, it's not. But watch this. If I control P, Let's, look, let's see what it looks like when I go to print. This is that exact same page we were just looking at, but with a different style applied. And the style that we applied simply removed this top navigation and side navigation, which would make no sense when we're printing it out. That's because those are different sections of the page, or in other words, they're different divs. So that's something that we're not going to take a look at right now, but we will look at it in more depth uh, when we get into cascading style sheets. Okay, uh, just a few more we want to talk about then. Uh, one other we want to talk about is a table. Table we should only really use for tabular data. A table is a whole set of nested elements. We're going to start with the open table tag and then end with a closed table tag. Within that, each row is going to be an open TR and then a closed TR. Within a row, we'll have an open TD and a closed TD and each of these open and closed TDs represents a cell within the table. So we only really want to use this when we're dealing with tabular data, kind of like the data that we see, I'll go back to red button, a little simpler search here, kind of like the data that we see uh, when we're looking at trees, like so. So this is a table. You can kind of see the table, how I've lined it up here. We have a row at the top, then we have a row that's broken into three cells, and those cells are essentially headings. Then we have a row which represents this eastern red bud, its Latin name, and its size. Another row represents the Appalachian red red bud, its Latin name, and its size. And repeat again and again. And then we have another row that represents the pictures, but that's another story. Let's not complicate things now. If I control P one more time and we look at the printout, again, you can tell this is a table. We have the heading, and then under each heading, we have rows of data, and each row of data is comprised of three different cells. Okay, so uh, table is good for using for showing tabular data, but we want to avoid trying to use it to format our pages. That was an old practice we did about, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, instead of using a table to put things in a certain place in the page, we prefer using our div tags that I talked about uh, in the last slide. And again, I know I just gave a quick example of that. Not to worry, we'll have a deeper example of divs when we talk about cascading style sheets. Okay, so a note on style. We want to use our HTML tags to essentially format our page and 
say where the content is, but we want to avoid the temptation to specify a font or a color or anything else like that inside of our page. I did that here on line six, but we're going to take that away in a future video. The reason being, it's a good idea to keep the content and structure of the page separate from the look and feel of the page. That way, you can make a page have a specific look and feel for a specific customer, and then a different look and feel for a different customer. It allows us to change the way that our page looks purely by changing that cascading style sheet, which we'll talk about in a future video. Here again, I mentioned this list of plants. This is the exact same HTML, what you're looking at right here. This is the exact same HTML that we have on this page here. Now, that's a good case study why we want different styling so that we can have one presentation that the user sees in a browser and a different presentation that the user sees when printing. Think about how we might expand that concept. When else would we want to change our presentation? We'll take a look at this. This is the plant details page, okay? So this is showing the plant details. I designed this page in 2006 when we safely assume that everybody would use this page in a browser, probably maximized. And you see that this page really consumes all of the pixels on my maximized browser. But have a look at this. This is really neat. I choose F12 in Chrome and look at this button here, Toggle Device Toolbar. This lets me see what this web page would look like on a mobile device. So I can toggle back and forth between a full screen and a mobile device. Notice, when I'm on the mobile device, notice that, that left navigation disappears. Do you see that? And it focuses the page on what's more important for a mobile device. Now, I probably should use that more. I should probably make more things disappear on this page. But uh, we want to think about separating the style, the look and feel. We want to think about separating that from the content and the structure of the content so that we can make a page that looks good on a mobile phone, on a full browser, and also when we're printing it out. So uh, different look and feels, a major concept that we're going to have right now when we're, when we're creating web pages. Okay, so more on that to come when we get to CSS. So that wraps up this discussion on the fundamental tags that everybody should know about HTML. As you might imagine right now, I'm going to go to Team Explorer. Before I forget, uh, I'm going to go to Changes, and I'm going to say the fundamental HTML tags that everyone should know. Okay, I'm going to confirm I have my picture, my contact us, uh, my index HTML, and a little project file, and then I'm going to commit all in sync. And indeed, take a look. As soon as I commit all in sync, you can see the commit that I just made, the fundamental HTML tags everyone should know. We can click on our change here, and you can take a look at exactly what I added, our contact us page. You can look at um, that one we didn't change ourselves. We see the image that I added, and then you see the changes that I made to our index HTML page. So have a look at that. Of course, I'll continue to update this repository as we go throughout this semester. Have a look. I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next video where we're going to talk a little bit more about styling our page. Thank you.